Funding for Colores was provided in part by the Nalita E. Walker Fund, KNME TV Endowment Fund, the Great Southwestern Arts and Education Endowment Fund, and viewers like you. This time on Colores. New Mexico Santero Nicolas Herrera weaves contemporary storytelling with traditional folk art. The thing about folk art, it's something from the soul. You know, it's something that, it's nothing you read in a book. It's something you live, it's something that lives in you. That's what folk art is all about. Artist Michelle Lasseline combines painting, performance, and mask making to inspire childlike wonder. Pulitzer Prize winning photojournalist Eddie Adams was often troubled that photos don't tell the whole story. He was very favorable towards the boat people picture, not because of the photography, but because the pictures had an impact on a political situation which involved the uh, opening up the gates to Vietnamese immigration. Juan Trujillo and wife Stephanie Shrimp of Kansas City Ballet teach young dancers the steps and discipline ballet requires. It's all ahead on Colores. Santero Nicolas Herrera is not held back by tradition. Most of my work is about my life. I'm an artist, that's what I do. I have fun doing what I'm doing. You know, some people call me El Santero del Rito. The thing about folk art, it's something from the soul, you know, it's something that, it's nothing you read in a book, it's something you live, it's something that lives in you. That's what folk art is all about. And I don't do it because I want it to look pretty like a doll or anything like that, like the fingers don't have to be perfect, nothing's perfect that I do, you know, but that's what makes it what it is. I like doing pieces about the water and the land, like when I started traveling to different cities and seeing the world, Man, I came back to El Rito one day and I'm like, I live in a beautiful place. And I ain't gonna throw my trash out of the window no more, that's it. So to me, nature is beautiful. So I think that my work has a lot to do with the good spirit and nature. I never have thought it's hard, it's, you know, the, it's just challenging. Because sometimes you could have a piece of wood and you're like, man, I don't know what I want to do with this. I've had pieces of wood laying around like for months. And then all of a sudden, boom, I get up one morning and I'm, I had a dream. This is it. This is what you're going to be. Like now I'm doing San Isidro, working the farm. And it's about the planting and the water and... We all need food and it's, we got little angels taking care of us. He's blessing the farms, he's, uh, he's out there. The root of my work is traditional and then it turns into contemporary. 
but you can always see a little traditional in there. So I decided to do the Three Kings and Harleys. They're going through El New Mexico and they're, they have the baby and they're protecting Jesus and the baby. There's a, a white dude, a black dude, and a brown dude on there. So it, there's no discrimination. We're all the same. So it's kind of making a statement of what's going on in the world. We're all the same. When it comes down to it, we came from the same place. That's what it's all about. You know, I have a piece in the Smithsonian with Jesus in the back of a cop car, and you know, that, that's pretty wild, because that's, you know, when Jesus was crucified, they, they you know, he could have put, been put in the back of a cop car nowadays. There's some museums in Wanek, they thought it was sacrilegious, because, you know, Jesus in the back of a cop car, I told him, Shh. If he will come doing the world now, he, he will be put in the back of a cop car and beat up. Some people have, you know, they don't like it, well, what can you do, you know? Usually when some people don't like your work, they, that's the best piece you've ever done. And I've been doing this since when I was a little boy. But I love to go to the dump, because that was, back in the day, it was an open dump. So my dad would be throwing the trash and I'd be scavenger. <laughs> I'd be looking for bike parts and rims and seats. And I'd, had, I'd come back with a bunch of junk. And my dad was like, you're bringing more junk back than what we took over there. To me, it's not junk. To me, it's art supplies. I like the patina. I like the colors, uh, the rust, the shapes. You know, back in the old days, stuff was really meant with pride. You know, a lot of this work was made to last. Like the storyteller piece there with my mom. That's me and my mom, she's a storyteller. That's a collaboration between me and Susan Guevara, but um, it was really cool to hear those stories from my mom just growing up, what they went through. You know, the depression years, they suffered a lot. It was hard for them to, you know, to make it. So those stories uh, come out a lot in my work too, for my mom and my dad and my grandfather. And, and then there's a picture of my dad as a, when he was in World War II. So a lot of that stuff, all that, that knowledge they had was like amazing what they knew. They knew how to survive. I paint the, the saints because they have beautiful stories of how, what they went through, what they suffered. It's important for people to know what's, how the world is working, what's been going on, what we see, how we live. The importance of it is to pass it on to other, to the new generation. a lot of these old artists that have passed away the other and they left something behind for me I want to leave that behind for somebody else so it'll keep going you know you can encourage these kids you know some kids you know they want to be artists and then people tell them oh, you're gonna starve <laughs> you know it's like you can't be an artist or you can't get into film because nobody can make it and it's like anybody can do may try it make it when you can express yourself with your heart and your mind that's a big deal, <laughs> you know? When you express yourself with a gun or with a, you know, that's not good. So, you know, that's what you want these kids to express themselves with, with their talent. Michelle Asseline brings a bit of magic to daily life. My name is Michelle Lasseline and I'm an interdisciplinary artist. I am a painter and a performance artist and a mask maker and costume designer. 
As I'm building a mask, the personality starts to appear with the kind of asymmetrical eyeballs and eyebrows and the mouth. Um, the expression starts to form a little bit by chance and a little bit by me molding it that way. When I get into one of those masks, I kind of become that character. Each character is like allowing me to isolate one part of myself and just really build on it and exaggerate it, which is really fun to do. I wear the goat most often, partly because it's a really sturdy one and it works well, the mouth works well. And it also kind of looks like a really ancient animal and like I kind of feel like a really old person when I'm wearing it. So I'm kind of subverting certain archetypes with different animals. One of my main goals is to create artwork that's really direct and interactive and accessible. I'm not trained in theater. My performances are more of a visual experience than something on stage. One of my most recent performances was for Art Town last summer, where I built a trailer that was towed by a bicycle and rode on the trailer as the coyote. And we would park at each art event or family event for our town and I would draw spirit animal portraits for kids. Our town is the Reno Arts and Culture Festival that happens during the month of July and this year I made the poster which features coyote and other animals in a parade. Our town put out their call for their poster artist and I applied with a proposal that involved animals in costumes, so they're kind of human bodies with animal heads wearing all different costumes, and it was um, accepted, which was very exciting. And then I worked with Art Town to come up with a final concept, and what we came up with was a herd of northern Nevada native animals, but wearing costumes that are kind of significant to the arts and culture of our region in a parade, kind of marching along the idea of each different version of the arts being represented, so music and dance and theater and painting. There's a bighorn sheep, of course, in the front with his kind of blue and white marching uniform on. And then there's the bluebird who is wearing this kind of showgirl outfit that's kind of gold. And that's based on all of the people who moved here to be in the Hello Hollywood show. Because uh, a lot of friends that I've had my age, their moms all moved here for that show. There's a rabbit who's wearing um, this kind of athletic costume because part of Art Town is being outside and biking around and walking and just being active in our wonderful climate and region. And then there's a pronghorn because they're a beautiful animal that not everyone knows we have here. And he's marching along with a big drum because of the kind of sound of their galloping feet. And then the coyote is behind that, which is kind of my representation of myself. She has a big paintbrush and she's splattering paint all over him. And then a burrow and a, a raccoon. A nuisance, but a really lovable little character. <laughs> My past performances have influenced uh, the Art Town poster for this year. Just combining kind of my love of painting with the performances in a new way. A lot of the masks came from painting, but now this painting is kind of going the opposite direction. The masks are influencing my painting. Having people interact with something that's out of the ordinary makes it feel like uh, an experience that's a little bit of a coincidence and a little bit magical in their daily life. And other goals for my performances are to inspire this kind of childlike wonder in people that we forget about, because um, that's what drives my artwork, I think. Widow Alyssa and photo editor Hal Buell reflect upon the work of photojournalist Eddie Adams. Eddie Adams won a Pulitzer for the famous uh, Saigon execution picture where the general is executing in Viet Cong. Eddie didn't like that picture. Loan, the, the police chief in, F, in essence, he just took a pistol out of his belt and walked up to him and bang, shot him just like that. 
Eddie thought this picture didn't tell the whole story. Loan's aide had been assassinated. His aide's wife had been assassinated. And four of their children had been assassinated by a Viet Cong assassination squad. And this guy in the picture was a captain in, of an assassination squad. And he was a, in every way a spy. He wore civilian clothes. He was not a military. So Eddie felt that Loan got a bum rap. Eddie worked for the AP for a number of years. I think he went to the AP in the early 60s. And um, I don't think he ever set out to be a war photographer. Eddie grew up in New Kensington, Pennsylvania, which is about uh, half an hour outside of Pittsburgh. He was working for the newspaper when he was in high school. And then he went to the Marines when he was 17 years old. The Marines went to Vietnam in 1965. And that's Eddie followed the Marines over there. You know, the guys trusted him. He was one of them. He was a Marine. Being a Marine really informed the rest of his life. Well, Eddie passed away in 2004, and he had never gone through his work himself. And so when he, when he passed away, there was all this body of work, and the first chunk that I thought I would work on is the Vietnam work. And so the idea was to do a book. And so I worked with Hal Buell, who was his former boss at the AP, and these pictures come from, um, from the book. Photography, journalistic photography, was on the edge of a change. It was becoming much more repertorial and, and not so titillating, but more informative. And uh, Eddie just fit that. Which pictures do I find the most uh, revealing of the war? One is a picture shot from inside of a helicopter looking out and a woman is reaching up appealing to be taken aboard the helicopter and there was absolutely no room on the helicopter. She had her wounded husband with her and Eddie made the picture and the helicopter took off and left her behind and that really affected Eddie. When you know the story, it's a woman begging to be, to be freed from whatever was going to happen next. And then there's another similar picture where in the foreground there's a Vietnamese woman carrying her child and her GI's running this way. There's a firefight going on. And in both cases, what I liked about the pictures was that it showed how close the war was to the civilian population of Vietnam and the people. There's a, another story that came later that he wanted to be known for, uh, that he was actually more proud of, and that was um, the pictures he did on the boat people. He was very favorable towards the boat people picture, not because of the photography, but because the pictures had an impact on a political situation which involved the uh, opening up the gates to Vietnamese immigration, and it was one of the contributing factors that finally Oh, uh, increased the number of Vietnamese who could be who could immigrate to the U.S. In fact, Eddie resented being called a combat photographer, a war photographer, because his work was not just Vietnam. That's two years of a 50-year career. He did all other kinds of photography. Juan Trujillo and Stephanie Shrimp help young dancers dream big. These kids, some of them come two hours before class even starts. And not because their moms are like, oh, I need to go somewhere else, I gotta drop you off early, but because they want to be here, they're dedicated. Now we're gonna do it together. Dos Anayos has to keep up. And three, quick your legs, and close, close. I just think Juan and Stephanie attract people who really wanna come here and work. It's not necessarily a social outlet for them. I mean, they can do social outlet yeah. elsewhere. Slow, allow the machine to help you to feel the muscles. What they won't find anywhere nearby, at least, is an array of Pilates and gyrotonic machines like this. Pretty as sculptures, designed to help dancers and regular folks alike rehab injuries and gain better body control. The couple had already been using some in a small business based out of their home. Until about five years ago, they decided to up the ante and open a school of their own. Stephanie remembers the first time they spotted this somewhat unexpected location. We drove into downtown Overland Park. There was one parking spot, and it was right outside this building, and a big sign that said, for sale. <laughs> and uh, we peeked in the window, and at that point, we didn't realize how big the space was or what it, what it could potentially turn into. 
One of the things I always said is that I could never teach for recreational purpose. So if we were going to get involved in a ballet school, I wanted the ballet school to be professional. So this is not a favor, this is not about finances, this is, it is about art. And if the kids are good, they're moved up. If they're not good, they have to stay where they are. We have parents that have been with us since we started the school, and they see this progress in their kids, and they're fascinated by it. How serious the kids are taking what they do, even though that they're very young. How what we teach them here in the classroom, they're able to take it into uh, everyday activities. We've had many years teaching experience, and over those years, we kind of developed this process that we feel really works for the kids. It's a real tough love situation. Um, they know we love them and care about them and want them to be their best, but we expect them to work at 100% all the time, with the exception of if they're injured or sick or having a bad day. One of the benefits of being a dancer and having had so many ailments, pains and aches, is I can relate to almost everything someone says. A, you know, a, a child comes to me and says, you know, my tendon is really sore. I know exactly how they're feeling and I sometimes can help them to feel better. Now offering six levels of instruction in a complex that's larger than it looks from outside, it's hard to believe the KSCB started with only three students enrolled. When they opened up, we came here, we followed them over, and haven't looked back. Julie Horton's oldest son, Riley, was one of that original trio. He's now studying and working with the Houston Ballet. At 15, her younger son, Connor, aspires to do much the same. This is maybe where we spend more of our waking hours than we do at our house. We're very grateful. I don't. I think every ballet school feels like family, but this really does. It's a family where language isn't much of a barrier. Like many Colombian kids, Juan grew up amidst great poverty. He credits Inco Ballet, the school he attended in Cali, with literally changing his life. So now each summer, students from South America arrive in Johnson County to spend several weeks taking classes and training on the kind of equipment they might not otherwise have access to. He was in their shoes and look where he is now and look, look at our studio and look at, at his career and it gives them inspiration that maybe they can do that too. It's the best part of the summer when the Colombians come and they have no idea what I'm saying and I have no idea what they're saying. And, but you know, that's the great thing about dance is that you don't necessarily have to talk. Ay, ay, ay. Traffic problems here. It transforms this studio into something different, which is what I think is so special about it for our home kids. Um, you know, this, this studio becomes an international dance studio. It's an amazing experience, it really is. Every year, more and more kids from Colombia have been able to participate. But Monica Guerrero has been involved all along. She's known Juan for decades. Now her duties include both training the school's instructors and fine-tuning its curriculum. Every time I come, I learn something, and I'm always learning something from him. He thinks that I'm giving something to the school, but I think the other way. Let's do plié as we close, so don't close first plié. One is looking for those boys and girls who have great opportunities in their bodies, but they don't have the opportunities economically. That's totally true with him. If it was up to Juan, he, everyone would go free. So he, yeah, that's really would be his goal. In fact, 30% of the Kansas School of Classical Ballet's students attend on scholarship. Juan calls it giving back. That also describes Let's Move, a new project recently undertaken with KVC hospitals. It brings basic dance training to troubled youths at a residential treatment facility in KCK. You know, they're excited for something new and it's a place for them to get away from the chaos that they're in. To walk in there and be able to just not think about anything else for a little while, but how to move my body and what's going on. When you're there, you see these kids smiling, you see these kids uh, playing, being creative, feeling comfortable in their own skin. To be able, as a person, to provide that, it is a privilege. Community support has nurtured this program specifically. 
and the school's quest for excellence in general. But it's hard to picture so much growth in such a short time if it weren't for the creative couple at its core. As much as I'm saying that we've been for 20 years together, I actually think if we were an average couple, we've been together for 40, right? Because we live together, we work together, everything has been together. But she's an incredible partner. I think that she's one of the best teachers I know. She's a very smart lady, she married right. <laughs>The Russian punk band and art collective Pussy Riot stopped in Albuquerque on their revolution tour. Maria Masha Eliokina takes a stand against war, corruption, and the suppression of freedom. To change something, to like overcome uh, things such as nationalism or sexism uh, or racism, uh, we should be together. Uh, it's not like... Uh, uh, some symbol or some messiah will come and uh, like uh, will help everybody. It's, it doesn't work like that. Uh, only together we can change everything. The Air Gallery brings hope to individuals who struggle with mental health. Bringing color and vitality to downtown St. Petersburg, Florida, murals also help build community. Culturally, St. Pete really wasn't like something that was too big, and it's, it's just grown by allowing the people to express themselves. I think it knows I'm here. The utility players are improv comedians that can adapt to any situation. GK! <laughs> Until next time, thank you for watching. Funding for Colores was provided in part by the Nalita E. Walker Fund, KNME TV Endowment Fund, the Great Southwestern Arts and Education Endowment Fund, and viewers like you.